Tonight's webinar is called um, Do Malaysians Care? And it's brought to you by MSGA, which is the Malaysian Students Global Alliance. The MSGA is a coalition of national student organizations worldwide with a mandate to serve and lead those under their jurisdiction. And to explain a bit more about what tonight's webinar is going to be about, it's a webinar in conjunction with MSGA's Racism and Bersama East Malaysia campaigns. And it has to do with the recent theme for our Malaysia, Malaysia Day and National Day celebrations announced by our Communication and Multimedia Minister, Datuk Saifuddin Abdullah, which is Malaysia Prihatin or Malaysia Cares. Now, as we all know, um, Prihatin means to pay attention, to show interest or to really care about something. But we see that there are groups and communities within Malaysia that may not truly receive the care, the attention and the help that they need, namely, you know, the mistreatment of immigrants into Malaysia, um, the challenging conditions faced by East Malaysians, especially students during this pandemic, as well as everyone in Malaysia who is um, in a rural environment, as well as refugees even being barred from entering the country. Those are the general concerns in the three communities that led to the implementation of this webinar with the theme of whether Malaysians truly care or not about the communities we need it most. Now, before I introduce our three panelists today, some basic groundkeeping rules for everyone to keep in mind. First, you are allowed to ask questions throughout the webinar in the chat. However, this is only available to those who are joining us through Zoom and not those who are watching on our Facebook Live right now. However, if you are watching through Facebook Live and you suddenly decide that you want to ask a question, there, the link to register and come in through Zoom is available for everyone and anyone who decides to come in and wants to pitch a question. Secondly, if you can't join or you can't stay for the entire duration, don't worry, because this entire webinar will be recorded and put up on Facebook. Thirdly, those of you who have registered and are here with us in Zoom, thank you for joining us. There will be feedback forms for you sent to your emails, and we'd really appreciate it if you fill those up and send those back to us. And fourthly, and finally, perhaps the most important rule is to keep muted throughout this webinar unless you're asked for questions during the um, floor questions section. And you are encouraged to keep your video on, however, despite muting your mic. So the general flow of what's going to happen today is until 9.30, we are going to have some moderated questions from, the, from me as your moderator. And from 9.30 onwards, 9.40 at the most, we'll be enjoying questions from you guys. So you guys will get to post questions to our speakers and um, we'll get to uh, answer them live on this webinar. So that should be about it for um, housekeeping rules and a general introduction to what this webinar is about. Now moving on, I'd like to introduce our um, three panelists today. Firstly, we have Ms. Azra Banu, who is a founding member of a number of local NGOs since the early 2000s, which include Care Refugees, Orphan Care, Viva Palestina Malaysia, BDS Malaysia, and is also a teacher at a private school teaching primary and secondary students since 2006. Ms. Azra should be here. Yep, okay. Secondly, we have uh, Marcella, Marcella, who is a 15-year-old who's enthusiastic about education and empowerment, especially in Sarawak. She founded the Sarawak Drive, which aims to empower more young Sarawakians. Is currently in the Undi Sarawak team as a content creator and as an active participant of the PID online as part of their student outreach team and hashtag Kids Takeover 2019 cohort. And last but not least, we have Adrian Pereira, who is the executive director and co-founder of the North South Initiative, a human rights and social justice oriented organization who has also worked with two United Nations accredited international organizations. Firstly, the Pax Romana International Movement of Catholic Students, the IMCS, as well as the Dignity International. So to all three panelists, thank you so much for joining us tonight to, in order to share with us your expertise and your experience in regarding this, um, these subjects. So um, before we get into the meat of what we're going on tonight, referring to racism, the status quo regarding refugees, immigrants, and how we can take action, maybe just to break the ice, we could have um, a very simple, uh, some very simple questions for the panelists here already in terms of what you do, what you do within your respective organizations and why their work is important and the sort of Im impact that you guys are doing right now. So nothing to, um, nothing as shallow as, as the description I just provided. Um, anyone would like to go first? Oh, 
or we can do it in alphabetical order. Um, Adrian, since your since your name starts with A, you could of course go first. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Adrian Pereira, and I'm happy to uh, to be given this chance to share my experience. So um, I run this small uh, NGO called North South Initiative, and uh, we aim uh, to to build solidarity with different communities, uh, migrants, uh, refugees, uh, communities uh, working and living in conflict zones in the ASEAN region. And uh, I also got a chance to work with uh, indigenous communities from uh, Sabah, Sarawak, and even Peninsula Malaysia, especially in the anti-mega dam campaign. So uh, the topics that are uh, to be discussed today are very close to my heart. And I uh, thank you for giving me this space, um, especially in a time when uh, uh, civic rights spaces and spaces to express ourselves are shrinking. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, next, could we have uh, Ms. Azra? Just explain to us a bit about the work it is that you do. Um, good evening, um, everyone. I'm assuming most for most of us, it's good evening. Uh, the rest may be good day. Um, my name is Azra. I'm the founder of Carefugees, an NGO that provides uh, support to refugees in Malaysia. We began operations um, in 2012 um, just uh, by simply providing food assistance um, to refugees, not, not knowing then that we would be in for a long haul. Um, currently, our assistants, um, we, focus, we like to focus on livelihood, uh, skills upgrading and education. Um, you know, everyone believes, right, rather than giving a man a fish, teach him to fish, right? So that's where our focus is um, with the refugee community here in Malaysia. All right. Thank you very much. And last but not least, could we have um, Marcella? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Marcella. You can just call me Mars or simply type in your name. So uh, I'm currently a content creator of the Sarawak Drive. So the Sarawak Drive is a newly established uh, NGO that we aim to empower more young Sarawakian to just uh, create a better Sarawak. Movement. Yep. Hi Marcella, I'm very yeah. sorry. Could you speak up? We seem to be having some yeah audio oh, difficulties. Yeah, yeah okay, so no sorry. worries. Could you, could, you, could you just um, tell us about the work that is you do and just speak up a bit? Okay, so uh, I'm currently the content creator of the Sarawak Drive. So the Sarawak Drive is basically, uh, we aim to empower more young Sarawakian to drive and get empowered to just create a better Sarawak. And I'm also currently part of the Project ID Student Outreach team. Uh, actually, it is a, a team where we got some students to facilitate and moderate that all the session in PID online that aim to empower students to lead self and lead others. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So now that we've gotten to know our speakers and panelists a little bit better, we can move on to the meat of our discussion today, which is um, the always, always very interesting question about racism in Malaysia. This seems to be an issue that never seems to quite go away. And we wonder if this um, is really an inherent issue. You know, many historians and writers, such as Yuval Noah Harari, who we all know from his awesome book, Sapiens, they look at events in the past to suggest that racism is ingrained in human beings as a sort of survival instinct when it comes to a species. And there's evidence for this in, they, people claim there's evidence for this in things like psychology, where there's inherent dislike for outsiders or the other. And even in the animal kingdom, in terms of the cannibalism or desertion, um, when it comes to those who look abnormal, even though they're from the same species. What this very broad discussion, however, is centered around is just a very simple idea or a very simple debate. Is racism inherent in our nature as humans? And what do the panelists think um, about this issue? Do you think that it's something that we're just born with and it's something that that we have to fight against, or do you think that it's something taught? So it's a bit of a variation on the, the nature versus nurture argument. Um, would anyone like to go first? Um, I'll go first. Thank yeah. you. Um, whether it's inherent or... Um, I, don't be, I don't believe it's something that we're born with, right? Um, but um, 
I do understand people wanting to seek the familiar and the comfortable. So we tend to seek people we can identify with and we can relate to, right? Where we find uh, comfort, right? So that I would think um, would be a natural tendency. How does that translate into uh, racism? Is um, I see this in young kids at school, right? I teach at a primary school, right? Uh, it translates into uh, racism um, when people make rather callous remarks, okay? Uh, you make callous remarks and callous, rather reckless remarks that children pick up very quickly on and repeat the same remarks, right? And over time, this easily becomes, um, they're not us, right? Uh, because the skin color is different, because the language is different, because the food is different, okay? So um, it starts off, I mean, this is a personal opinion, yeah, it's anecdotal and not uh, based on any, any research, but it starts off as something uh, you, you kind of gravitate towards the familiar, and then it worsens from there due to just this Callous uh, remarks, and and it's it made it's made worse because we tend to when we gravitate towards the familiar, familiar, it's gravitating towards people who are same as us. So you're not getting to know people who aren't you, so to speak. Right? I'll just end it there. So you know, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, any other panelists who'd like to weigh in on this issue and whether racism is something inherent or or do we think that it's taught? Uh, yeah, uh, can I go? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, allow me to just share some reflections. And uh, when you mentioned um, about the uh, cannibalism, uh, I think that that for me was a bit shocking because uh, uh, at, at this modern time of, uh, of uh, intellectual discourse and with the amount of research done, um, including the, the, the different human rights um, frameworks. Uh, I, I come from a human rights background, so uh, my, my focal point always goes back to, to write a rights-based analyst. And um, I think the standards have been set um, on how we define uh, racism. And uh, we shouldn't uh, discount that uh, we, we, we don't know that uh, these definitions exist. Um, compared to, uh, I think, what Azra's point of differentiating between that uh, wanting to be in a comfort zone which is uh, familiar, uh, that, that is something that uh, could be natural. Uh, but uh, when it comes to racism, I think the implications are uh, much more serious. I think we have seen global events where uh, millions of people have been killed um, as a result of historical uh, and political um, uh, persecution uh, based on either religion, race, uh, even nationality. So um, at this point of time, in the year 2020, uh, I think the, the human mind, and I hope um, uh, the students here um, can, can help uh, develop a whole generation who's able to think and, and know the difference uh, in, in how to, to intellectualize and uh, prevent racism from happening, especially the structural racism. So uh, we need to go beyond then, then uh, in, in our analysis from, from just looking at someone uh, differently because of their color or, or because of their, their, their religion and having a kind of uncomfortable or discriminatory uh, attitude to something that is a bit more structural. Yeah. Now, just a follow-up question um, on, on that. Adrian, you mentioned that you come from a human rights background and that's, of course, the, the analysis that you bring to this issue. Now, of course, this framework has often been criticized as highly individualistic, highly, you know, um, and it claims to be universal in terms of, you know, providing a universal definition for racism, a universal definition for what counts as discrimination. Whereas a lot of people, perhaps even in Malaysia, would just go, you know, um, different types of people are left best amongst their own types of people. And they, they, and they would think that, you know, we, we shouldn't always follow these Western human rights, so on and so forth, when it comes to discourse in Malaysia. Have you, have you experienced something similar to this in your work? And do you think that, that ultimately questions like this are of, any, are of any worth in terms of the discourse that's being perpetuated in our, in our Malaysian society when it comes to racism? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, human rights has, uh, has been criticized as a liberal uh, ideology that is, um, as, that is seeping into Malaysian society. But, but it, to, to be fair to the, to, to the critic, I think uh, they, there is an inculturation element. Uh, unfortunately, in, in Southeast Asia, especially our, our leaders have used that uh, as an excuse to, to curb or prevent uh, human rights um, implic uh, applications, uh, probably for X, Y, and Z reasons, like uh, staying in power, keeping uh, the majority in a particular uh, position of support. So, so that that critic has has uh, always been around, and I think I'm sure you all saw a poster, a liberal poster, being uh, circulated that you know kind of implied that 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 human rights are of. Um, uh, of a, you know of a alien origin and i think we need to 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 address that uh, with regards to the question on if rights is a individual or a collective um, uh, standard or agreement uh, it they, they are there are communities which um, are affected so uh, there's uh, there's the civil political rights which looks at the individual uh, and also collective uh, standards, but you also have economic, social, and cultural rights, which look at, at a more um, social justice kind of, of, of rights. So, so you have both. You have both in the spectrum of rights. All right. Thank you very much. And now moving on to Marcella, perhaps you could um, back on the same question regarding whether or not um, you know, we think racism is something inherent or that it's taught. Do you have any experience of this in your work as, you know, a content creator for Wendy Sarawak, where a lot of this is based on, you know, changing um, popular perceptions that people might have, especially when it comes to the division between Malayans and, you know, Sarawakians and Sabahans. Do, would you, um, do you think there's anything that you've experienced yourself through your work that um, would shed some light on this idea of us versus them being something inherent or something learned? Thank you for this opportunity. So <clears throat> throughout my work uh, for now, because we are newly established, so there wasn't much uh, topics about racism. However, I still feel that <clears throat> that uh, racism is something that is being not not being born to, but it was quite to like you learn from somebody like what uh, Miss Azra mentioned just now. So like in East Malaysia, we because we have so many. Uh, Indonesian worker over here because uh, we are quite near to the border. So uh, when for the as as a young Marcella back then, uh, when I get naughty or just uh, being so playful, uh, the elder one will just say that uh, if you are keep on being playful, I will just send you to the certain part of Indonesia or just send you to the place there that is there is so many uh, Indonesian worker because they will wrap you something like that. So uh, I. That is how I was quite uh, scared when I'm seeing Indonesian passing by and I will just get, get away from it. But I'm so thankful that I was getting educated by this around my age of 15. No, sorry, 14 last year. And I was talk about that uh, this is a form of racism and also a form of bullying toward the other uh, race. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Now, moving on from this general idea of, of what racism is, we can, of course, see that there are many ways racism in Malaysia is expressed. First of all, of course, internalized racism when it comes to stigmas and stereotypes in um, our society, which perhaps our panelists may have even experienced personally. And, um, of course, there's also systemic or structural racism when it comes to the organizations and the structures of the state in Malaysia, um, speaking very broadly, when it comes to general policies or perhaps even laws which um, could be seen as racist in nature. And then, of course, we have, again, um, organizational um, uh, racism when it comes to not really the state, but maybe even you know private companies, private entities, and things like that. Um, given in my... Uh, keeping in mind that there isn't that racism isn't just limited to people going oh this person is bad because of his his or her race given the many ways in which racism is um you know expressed in our society do you think that there can be an accepted amount of racism 
such as, you know, stereotypes and generalizations that occur in our media because they're funny, maybe some people might say, or in policies because it makes economic sense, so on and so forth. Do you think there's an accepted amount of, of racism that should be accepted by, by Malaysians? Uh, let me start first. Okay. Go ahead. So, uh, I, do th- I don't think that there is uh, an accepted amount of racism, but however, uh, without some uh, issues like the 13th, 13th of May, 1969, that happened in Peninsula Malaysia, uh, it won't make people realize how important it is to appreciate and value the peace and harmony living environment without the issue. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Just a, f- a quick follow-up question. People, there's this general perception that racism is much more pronounced in West Malaysia and Malaya than it is in, in Sabah and Sarawak. Often we, often we hear that, oh, this doesn't happen in Sabah and Sarawak. Everyone lives, you know, this is much better over there. Well, as, as someone who's, of course, from those states yourself and who's working very, very widely with those projects, how, how much truth do you think there is to that sentiment? Oh, there must be some uh, racism <laughs> issue like, among the East Malaysian, but uh, to be really honest, it wasn't that big issue like the 13th of May that happened in uh, Malaya back then. So, uh, like like what I mentioned just now, uh, in the, between the Indonesian worker or just some uh, Indian that come from Peninsula to Sarawak, sometimes the people will just stare at them when they just sit on the uh, in the kopi piam. And then, so I feel like it was, uh, even though I know that it was quite wrong to see them differently, but uh, sometimes it just cannot bear myself like see oh, what why why does he come here because we don't might have much uh Indian in uh, Sarawak and Sabah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe a lack of expo- exposure in, yes, that, yeah. in that case. All right. Would anyone um anyone else like to talk about this idea of different um different forms of racism and whether any of this should be acceptable? Uh can can I attempt? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so uh I think Malaysia after uh, more than 60 years of, of uh, independence and um, it's quite important that we reject racism in all its forms. Uh, of course, in the, in the United Nations or the human rights system, we have something what we call affirmative action where we uh, certain uh, groups of people in a disadvantaged position are given an additional boost. But uh, the debate... Um, uh, on the, the question of affirmative action is that it shouldn't be uh, based on race, but actually it should be based on the economic capacity or the social capacity of a particular community. So uh, unfortunately, uh, in the Malaysian context, um, there's, there's a bit of overlap. And uh, I think that's always um, the way politicians uh, use their or flex their, their muscles or to to you know, to keep a certain status quo going, uh, I think it's about time you know that uh, this new generation, especially the uh, uh, MSGA, uh, your generation has the duty to to do what my generation failed to accomplish, uh, which is totally rejecting racism in whatever form it comes in. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. And maybe Miss Azra, you could you could talk about your work with um, refugees in Malaysia because this is often a neglected aspect of. Um, in terms of systemic racism against them and seeing them as, you know, others who don't fit in into Malaysia. Would you, would you say that this has played a role in, in what you think about accepted amounts of racism in Malaysia? Um, I would um, echo Adrian that there isn't any ex- a level of racism that we can accept, right? Um, I would also go as far as say there is a bit of racism in all of us. It's just, what do you do with it? Do you express it? Do you act on it, right? Many of us, we have a tendency to stereotype people, to box people, to categorize them, right? Um, um, we have to fight that urge. We really should fight that urge. I mean, it's in all of us. It's difficult to eradicate racism 100% from the self, right? But we can stop from acting on it. Um, so no, there isn't any level that we can accept, and uh, uh, it's up to the individual, right? We we don't have access to the structural racism 
that um, in, that's within many societies, but we do have access to the individual, right? So I think, yeah, definitely more level is accepted. And refugees are an easy target, um, right? They're just the favorite punching bag for many years now, not just here in Malaysia, but globally. And um, as I, 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 I keep repeating, uh, Malaysia has fallen victim to the global narrative on refugees. Yeah. Right? When we started this work many years ago, people had empathy towards the refugee, right? There, there was much empathy. It was a lot easier to get things done. And we saw how things changed. The discourse changed, the narrative changed, just following the global trend, right? What happened in Europe, they were literally kicked out, right? I mean, those fleeing from Syria via Lebanon, uh, via Turkey into Greece. Uh, we just saw the same thing here in words, in discourse. Yeah. That's, that's actually the last part of what you're talking about is actually very interesting. Just a follow up question um, Do you think that the very sudden change in discourse that we had here? In Malaysia, which I'm sure all of us are familiar with, regarding you know refu Rohingya refugees from Myanmar, you frame this as part of a, a wider global phenomenon, extend all over the world, from you know in um, pop when populist leaders come to power, in, even in the West. Do you think that this is this? Do you think that this explains most, if not all, of the sudden resurgence, or do you think there's a more local reason when it comes to Southeast Asia or Malaysia in terms of this change in discourse? Unfortunately, things here are so heavily politicized that the right everything's just so politicized that the refugees get caught up in the politics of this nation as well. So there is another dimension to what the refugees go through here in Malaysia. You have the global discourse that's really just painted them in one wide brush, right? One wide stroke, and then you have the local uh, political context that's not uh, favorable to them at the moment. Yep, absolutely. Thank you so much. So now going on to the status quo and what things look like on the ground right now, especially in Malaysia. This first question will be for Ms. Azra when it comes to refugees, which is once again, a very hot topic today. Now, currently we estimate there are 178,000 foreigners in Malaysia. And of course, these are divided into not only refugees, not only um, refugees, but asylum seekers as well. And we know that those with UNHCR cards receive discounts on healthcare, etc., etc. However, um, Malaysia has still not ratified the 1951 Refugee Convention under the UNHCR, and they've justified this by saying that um, this is a this is a, a compromise on the rights of their citizens, i.e., us Malaysians, that they're not willing to take. Do you think that the government's concern in rejecting the refugee convention, the UN Refugee Convention, is a justified one? valid grounds, um, right? Uh, there is real concern. Ask, ask the general Malaysian and everyone's afraid of um, foreigners coming in and taking what's ours, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's understandable. And uh, for the, why hasn't the government ratified the convention? Um, you know, I, I don't want to speculate on that, right? Um, but does that affect uh, refugees here? Yes, it does. Um, uh, uh, does that mean that their rights aren't protected? Yes, it means that, okay, because they're technically um, not legal um, over here. Um, so I, I would, uh, if you ask me, is it justified? No, not, not ratifying the treaty. I think the fear would be if you do that, you open up an entire Pandora's box. Right, because Malaysia is so accessible uh, via many uh, borders. So I, I don't blame the government for not ratifying it. Yeah. Unfortunately, it means that the refugees have a tough life here. Yeah. But given that, they're not, that this is not ratified, the convention is not ratified, and thus we do not officially recognize many people as refugees, even though they are fleeing you know, acts of, of absolute horror, does this mean that there are less protection for refugees in Malaysia? And what, what terms have, on, and have you seen you know, examples of this in working on the ground and seeing what refugees themselves go through? That perhaps we as Malaysians, we're very comfortable in our own homes that we don't know about some basic you know, protections for refugees that simply don't exist because they're not recognized as refugees. Hmm. They're exploited in every 
imaginable way. Okay, at work, um, I mean, they, they, they do meager work, right? They do menial work. They get paid pittance, if at all. Um, they can't complain. If they don't get their month end salary, they have no recourse. They can't go and lodge a complaint because technically they aren't even allowed to work. Uh, healthcare access, only if you've got a UNHCR card, you get a 50% discount at the um, government hospitals. Otherwise, you pay the full fee, which is very high, you know, um, and they've got medical issues just like everybody else. Uh, so I think, um, I, I will just sum it up in one word, exploitation. They're so easily exploited because they have no legal shade to stand under. I see. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Now, moving on to Marcella and bringing our discussion um, to East Malaysia and its relationship with um, Peninsular Malaysia. This year, we'll have Hari Malaysia will mark 57 years since 1963 of you know, the establishment of our country as a federation. But despite this, um, it's common knowledge that when it comes to development, Peninsular Malaysia is, is far ahead in, uh, compared to that of East Malaysia. This is despite the wealth of resources and etc. that is present within um, East Malaysia. Some basic um, um, statistics such as doctors to patient ratios, um, how easy it is for Bumi Putra youth to gain career opportunities, and how um, how many businesses in Sabah and Sarawak are micro or small enterprises as opposed to larger enterprises that don't need to struggle to stay afloat. All of these things we can see, um, there's a very, very large gap that may even be widening between East Malaysia and West Malaysia. So my first question for you, Marcella, would be, what do you think the main reasons for the gap in development would be, whether it's a political or social or, very, or just a geographic problem? Uh, thank you for this uh, question. I really think this is a great question to be raised up. So uh, from what I have learned and read is that mainly geographic and demographic because uh, as a whole state itself, Sarawak is bigger than the whole Semenanjung Malaysia. However, we have a quite small population. So in World Population Review says that uh, Selangor has a approximately 5.4 million of population and Sarawak actually has 2.4 million of population as in 2010. So, but I don't know if the people being less over here just because they are very ruder or not. But I believe if the uh, being the state that has our own autonomy and ruling system that is important to fulfill every unseen need by the other state, uh, our people know our best what we need. We just, we don't really need a tall building like KLCC or to be compete with uh, Burj Khalifa, but we just need a simple things like education opportunity and access, roads, uh, internet coverage, and all that simple stuff that we can list down. But as an urban girl, to mention just now that uh, youth employment, uh, actually Bintulu, uh, the current, the currently place that I best in, and also my own hometown, uh, the house prices over here is actually very very expensive, and there can be so many squatters that can be seen around Bintulu. So I can't even imagine if I want to buy a new house over here in the next 10 years. Is If my monthly salary is at 8k and above, I don't know is that even legit or a big chances for me to afford a proper house. So I also read uh, in 2016 saying that Bintulu is the current highest uh, living cost in Malaysia. Yeah, so wow. that's what we need, actually. Okay. Given your experience, of course, as someone from that, that region of Malaysia, do you think there are any other pressing issues facing um, East Malaysians when it comes to the difference between development, you know, when, especially when it comes to youths? Maybe in underemployment, you know, being underpaid and um, not enough career opportunities. Do you, do you think there are any pressing issues that maybe aren't given enough attention by mainstream media and mainstream discourse that we have now? answer this question uh, no no rush no no rush no rush oh, okay. <laughs> okay there's actually uh, I can say that we actually has 
a big chance of employment over here, especially in Bintulu, because we do have this oil and gas uh, and Bintulu port, all that places. And but there, there are still quite a lot of uh, worker from Semenanjung and Sabah. Uh, Sabah not not so much, but especially Semenanjung. So I think the reason why there are more Semenanjung people in uh, Bintulu, uh, plus my school, because my school is quite near to Bintulu Port. Uh, so mm -hmm. we got a lot of Semenanjung students that uh, come to Sarawak to just be with their parents because yeah, their parents are working here. So because uh, maybe they have more uh, better skill than the current youth and worker in Sarawak. So I think the one I think the the reason why we the youth impo uh sorry the youth employment over here is quite less is because uh some Sarawak skin just don't, don't just receive a good education and because mainly my my own youth group they actually didn't really pay much to education they were just playing around because they feel like education won't get them any uh, anyway yeah all right that's what i feel about it thank you very much um, my last question for you marcella would be regarding representation amongst east malaysians because clearly this is an issue when we see you know discourse when it comes to malaysia oh malays chinese indians and others in malaysia and it seems very often that east malaysians are sidelined but even within this you know um east malaysians are not one group there are you know, people, Sarawakians, there are Sabahans, there are Dayak, and within the Dayak, Dayak itself is an umbrella term. Dusun, Kadazan Dusun itself is an umbrella term. Do you think that there is a common shared Malaysian identity amongst East Malaysians? And if not, do you think that there are any main differences? And moving on from whether or not this... So firstly, is there a common shared identity? Secondly, do you think that stereotyping East Malaysians as one block has been harmful towards, you know, a representation and accurately depicting East Malaysians when it comes to um, general media and, and in discourse in Malaysia? Uh, well, it depends on people like me. I am a Malaysian, but I do sometimes uh, see myself as only a Sarawakian or an Iban when I go outside the country. Because I feel like uh, West Malaysians are already enough to represent Malaysia. So, and then we'll just be sidelined. So, when I say that I came from Borneo, people will be more interested to know oh, what is happening in Borneo. Do you guys really live, in, uh, live on the trees like what people always say? So, I love how they're uh, really interested to know more about Borneo. So... Uh, however, there are still some people that is still having the pre-independence mindset, of, especially in James Book, Punya colonial times. So, like in Sarawak, we have this S for S Sarawak for Sarawakian. So, and recently there 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 is a slightly controversial issue that going around in Sarawak is that the colonial flag and the old Sarawak flag that was hung around in Padungan Kuching. So, uh, there is a minister saying that. If you like hung this flag, it means that you are not uh, patriotic. Yeah. So, <laughs> but because we know that uh, Sarawak from Sarawakan is actually a, a line from our past chief minister, the, the Adunan Satem, I actually forgot his punya short name. <laughs> so, um, some people uh, they use this to uh, to gain our right back, like the all royalty, and then the equal partner with Semenanjung Malaysia as yep. the federal government itself. Yep. All right. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Now moving on to Adrian and your work with with immigrants in Malaysia. Um, we all know that um, Malaysia has millions of um, documented migrant workers, numbering uh, more than two million and three or four million undocumented migrant workers. And of course, uh, many of us are also familiar with the recent events whereby Malaysian police raided homes and arrested hundreds of these undocumented migrants, um, purportedly in an attempt to contain the spread of, uh, of COVID-19. 
Now, they also have limited access when it comes to health and social welfare services, and even have additional barriers, including financial costs, which we discussed a bit about um, just now with regards to um, Ms. Azra's um, answers when it came to you know, accessing healthcare and exploitation. Uh, my first question for you would be, what do you think the main issue is when it comes to this very clear lack of protection of immigrants' rights in Malaysia? Do you think it's cultural, political, legislative, or is it something else completely, or a combination of these factors? Yeah. So, uh, thanks for the uh, quite quite difficult and challenging question. But uh, if we go back to the title of "Do Malaysians Care," I think uh, my question back to uh, Malaysians and also the the participants here is uh, to to relook at our worldview of how. Uh, we look at people who are on the move. So um, even like just now when you mentioned, you know, the, the categories, uh, Malay, Chinese, Indian, done line, line. I mean, even with, with our own uh, uh, struggle to define Malaysians, we kind of like get uh, caught in a, in a trap of uh, not being inclusive. Uh, and if, if we look deeper, I mean, all of us, almost all of us come uh, from different backgrounds, uh, if you look at our history, uh, where do our ancestors come from? We're all people on the move, um, and, um, and and it's, it's the the migrant or even the refugee and asylum seeker who come. They they also people on the move. They they're looking for a better life. Um, unfortunately, in Malaysia, what what from from my experience of analyzing those categories you shared, I, it looks more uh, like an exploitative. Uh, um, uh, structure to, to 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 maximize the economic benefits from the migrants and of course uh, the, the migrants and the refugees being forced or, or or not having enough job opportunities they also come here uh, hearing beautiful stories and and of about malaysia so um uh, while uh, there could be some competition with malaysians for jobs but uh, my analysis it's it looks very clear the economy uh, economic system needs them to exploit them for maximum output. And uh, I have a theory that um, in terms of economic output, uh, one migrant could replace three Malaysians in terms of uh, productivity. Uh, and I'd even go further to say that it could even be five. Um, I've seen migrants work 16 hours a day uh, with the minimum wage, without uh, access to unions, without access to collective agreements, so uh, we, we can, uh, I, I'm confident that can be proven uh, mathematically. So, um, of course, then you have the political funding involved. You have, um, you know, that um, the, 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 the politicians always using uh, racism and xenophobia to, to you know, to, 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 dream, to move focus, to shift the focus away from uh, national issues. And that's what I think happened. Uh, during the the first of May raids, um, it, it was um, Malaysia was very well in a very well organized manner checking the health of of the migrants, documented or undocumented, and and even at one stage we we, we told the migrants, uh, don't worry, if, even if you don't have your papers, come forward, we will take care of you, and that was globally praised for 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 what happened. Unfortunately, on the first of May. Uh, somebody decided to do a raid, and uh, we were shocked. We were shocked. The whole world was shocked. Uh, medical experts said that if you are, if your detention centers cannot hold or does not have the capacity, don't arrest people. And unfortunately, uh, the government of Malaysia refused to do that. So it backfired. Eh? There, there were spikes. There were outbreaks in detention centers, and even uh, there was one in Sabah a few days ago. So uh, I think the system is exploitative, but the challenge to all of you here in, in the MSGA is to, to relook at our worldview of, of, of how people on the move uh, are treated. Why, why do we need to, to evaluate or judge them based on their passport? And I think that is your second question on whether uh, you can compare racism to, can you be uh, xenophobic and racist at the, at the same time? I don't think you can. If if you if you uh, if you have certain bias towards others, just because they have another passport, you you come you fall under the same category of of a dis discrimination, and 
uh, I would go on to further call that uh, kind of race uh, of racist. You know, it may not be based on your ethnicity, but you are discrimination based on your on your on your uh, nationality on, and even your class. Um, you know, if you're if you're a lower skill or low wage migrant you're treated differently compared to an expat. And for me, that's, that's not acceptable, you know. So, so let's reevaluate our worldview. Uh, you know, we are all uh, in a globalized world. We, we have to rethink how borders work, you yeah? This actually leads um, quite conveniently into one follow-up question from me. You mentioned just now about the exploitative nature of migrants in, uh, and how we treat migrants in Malaysia and your theory on on, you know, given the long hours and the low wages for migrants, we might actually need them because they can do a job equal to, you know, three Malaysians or even five Malaysians. What do you make of the argument that says that when it comes to xenophobia, um, it, is, uh, it is justified for us to, you know, discriminate against them because they're leeching off resources in our country. This is a very common argument that, that yeah. we hear that, you know, we have limited resources. We are not a very rich country, Malaysia. And so thus we must prioritize our own citizens above immigrants. And that's yeah. so this not, they argue this is not racist, but this is, it might be xenophobic, but you know, it, it makes economic sense. What do you make of this argument? No, actually it's a very uh, false uh, economic notion. Uh, the World Bank has already kind of proven it. And even uh, ideas, ideas has also come up with the analysis of how uh, refugees, if given the right to work, actually uh, add on value to the economy. So um, the, the, what actually was supposed to happen, and, and you can just look down south to Singapore in how they manage migration and, and the, the, their population. So, so while um, the migrants were doing the, what we call 3D work uh, and slogging and, and, and giving their, their sweat and blood to certain type of works, uh, the Malaysians were supposed to have gone to a higher value kind of jobs uh, be it in service, finances, science, research. Unfortunately, uh, our economic design wasn't done in that way. And it's really sad because uh, the potential was there. And that's what Singapore managed to do. I'm not saying they're, they're perfect. They have problems with, their, with, with racism uh, towards migrants also. But uh, our, uh, our Malaysians' uh, uh, economic system, education systems kind of stagnant, was stagnant. So there are communities which can't even pass uh, UPSR till today. Uh, there are a big percentage of them. Uh, I, I don't want to mention which groups. Uh, you can do your research. Uh, it's unfortunate. So uh, the, the World Bank goes on to say that for every X amount of foreigners, uh, our GDP or the Malaysian, the Malaysian income actually increases. So economically, it's totally debunked. The, the fear of competition is actually false. It, it doesn't work. Uh, that, that easily can be debunked. So it, it goes back to the politicians, you know, uh, using this kind of fear. And um, uh, I know for ex one example, the levy alone paid by migrants or their employers is in the billions. It can easily subsidize any service for migrants or refugees. Absolutely no. And that's not count counting the GST they pay or the SST is not counting the GDP value. So I think uh, one day when, if any of you here graduate as a, in whatever field, and if you want to help us uh, put the truth forward, uh, please, uh, we'd be very happy to work with everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Right. So moving into the third part of this webinar, which is general questions for um, all the panelists in when it comes to taking actions. We can see um, 2020, many, many protests all over the world from Black Lives Matter in the United States to, you know, developments even within Malaysia where we had a, an outrage over racist statements made even in our own parliament with regards to um, YB Kasturi, uh, who is of Indian ethnic origin based on the colour of her skin. Um, my first question to um, either Miss Azra or Adrian would be, why do you think the plight of um, refugees and immigrants are not talked about as much compared to um, the plight of non Bhumiputra in Malaysia? And what do you think we can do to improve this situation? So generally, so to rephrase that question, we can see the Bhumiputra versus non Bhumiputra issue. This is a very divisive issue and it gets brought up a lot in national discourse. 
um, it's, it's given a lot of airtime. Why do you think that refugees and immigrants, you know, don't get as much of this attention, despite the fact that arguably, you know, they don't even have a lot of the basic rights that all citizens of Malaysia are entitled to? Um, I'll leave that to Adrian. I think he's okay. in a better position. <laughs> okay. No worries. Um, you see, but I, I go back to a rights-based approach of, of having uh, sufficient information to analyze, uh, to question the government's policies, to, for us ourselves as citizens to be involved in these processes. And even after 15 years of, of human rights activism, I feel so disconnected with how policies are made. Uh, yeah, we once in every uh, few years we go, we put in our vote. But when when I reach out to my MPs or adons to to you know to get this kind of answers, why why are we sidelining migrants? Why are we still stuck in the in the internal argument of you know Bumi Putra versus non Bumi Putra? But you know these questions are oversimplified, and uh, you know I, I I'm scared that you know if uh, oversimplified we do a disservice to the discourse. So uh, once again, I go back to uh, rights-based solutions of you know uh, having correct information to to make decisions. Um, why are Malaysians not getting the jobs? And you know, let's be honest. Um, I, I would challenge the the Ministry of Youth. I challenge the Ministry of Human Resource. If you really want Malaysians to get jobs, eliminate forced labor, eliminate trafficking of migrants. You know, so we we don't know a lot of things, and uh, it's very difficult to. To, to prevent the uh, to put forward the discourse on migrants uh, and and I don't want to make it a migrants versus Malaysian debate. Uh, I mean somehow uh, I mean there are millions of Malaysians abroad. They, they, it's big numbers. It's not small. They they are they are undocumented Malaysians, my friends. You know, working in very very difficult conditions. Um, we we just don't address those. So so I I think. We need to broaden the question to so it doesn't look like a Malaysian versus migrants. Yeah, uh, that's my, a bit of my reflection. Yeah. I don't think I can answer the question. Okay, well, no, I, I think I can add on. Yeah, add absolutely. Uh, let's let's go back to the uh, topic, which is uh, do Malaysians care? And I think in large numbers they do. Okay, in large numbers they do, and we saw this during the lockdown um, when there was just constant, continuous um, aid coming through uh, for the marginalized and, um, you know, people under hard, um, hardcore poverty. So the general answer to that would be yes, when it comes to the crunch, Malaysians care, okay? Um, 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 for us, for example, care refugees, we raise uh, money for refugees every year, each year to provide them food aid um, for the month of Ramadan. This year, we had people giving us money for Sabah, right? We had so many uh, Malaysians from Sabah reaching out to us and we in turn turned to our um, donors and our supporters and people were happy to give. Uh, when it comes to the crunch, I think the Malaysians in general, they care. When it comes, uh, where, where we fall short is again, falling victim to politicized uh, rhetorics, right? And uh, um, statements that really just serve um, people's interests, uh, political interests. So we tend to buy wholesale into these things. Uh, that, that's where I think we need to wisen up uh, as people and break stereotypes. Um, we were talking about Dan Lion Lion, right? Um, others. I grew up as an others. I grew up in Singapore as an others, right? And I highly recommend everybody to live as an other right? Live as a minority, be an other, because then you become sensitive uh, to others' needs, you know. I, 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 once I was teaching in my classroom, primary school kids, and we were talking about various countries in the world, and when it came to Africa and India, I could see a reaction from the students, you know, that, that, that really disturbed me. And I stopped my class there and then, and I asked them, where do you think teacher Azra's from, right? And I said, my forefathers, my, my forefathers came from Pakistan. But when they did, it wasn't even Pakistan. Guess what it was? It was India. So you know what? Your teacher Azra's Indian. 
right? So we spoke about worldview. You mean, Adrian, you mentioned worldview, and this is how we need to manage children's worldview, get them to break stereotypes, get them to open up their worldview and see things the way, you know, uh, in a more, I, I hate to use the word liberal, I really don't like the word liberal, right? But, but, but um, look at things differently and not the way we are told or we are taught to. There's so much, so much that we can do with this worldview. Um, it, and it's something that we teach, um, I teach at school, right? Telling our children that we need to um, look at our worldview because the way we view the world is the way we act, right? And this is something we must um, manage within ourselves. And if we are in position of authority or teaching, then with the students and with the kids we deal with. Yeah. Absolutely. Great point on, on molding stereotypes and breaking new stereotypes from from a very young age, thank you. So moving on to our next question, um, what are some critical areas within your community or the community that your work focuses on that you wish to see improvements on? This could be East Malaysians, refugees, migrants of all sorts. What are some critical areas, you know, perhaps it's housing, cost of living, et cetera, et cetera, that you would want to see improvements on as a priority? Any, anyone, anyone. Marcella, maybe? Oh, sorry, what was the question again? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Uh, sorry, what, what was the question again? It, um, what are some critical areas in your community that you would like to see improvements on? This is quite you know, a wide question, so it's up to you guys. You know, perhaps it's, it's employment opportunities for East Malaysians, representation for East Malaysians. You know, most people, the only East Malaysian they know is Henry Golding. So, you know, a, a lot of broad range of issues that affect um, these communities. So what, in your opinion, we talked about this just now when it came to you know, um, employment and, and so on. So from your perspective, what are some critical areas where you, you, you think we need help? Okay, so as a student myself, I think uh, I really want my friends and really need my friends oh, yeah, and people around me to realize how important education is because, yeah, because uh, we can't blame the government for not be bringing them into the great company to hire them because they don't have the qualification to be in that company. So I, I want my friends and my youth group getting empowered and be able to reach their fullest potential because there is so much within them, but sometimes they have this mindset of that the uh, syllabus in the education system only sided with smart people. So uh, this is really what I want to see among my community and especially in my own uh, race, Iban. Uh, Daya, yeah. All right, thank you. Um, maybe from um, Ms. Azra or Adrian on um, some critical areas for refugees or migrants which absolutely need improvement right now. For example, protections or housing, employment protections, unionization, etc. I would say access to legal employment. Um, okay. Yeah, because um, um, being able to work legally would bring them an income and um, this would uh, help them sort out so many things in their life is because they don't have an income that we have a host of um, other problems right in their life they can't make ends meet they have to beg for food uh, they they can't take care of any medical issues right so um, to start with uh, legal access to employment um. All right, thank thank you so much, um, Adrian. Oh uh, yeah, so I think uh, <coughs> uh, Muhammad Akil has given a suggestion to draft a policy that can support these groups. Um, we we would really need an, a very urgent, um, comprehensive policy to look look at these issues. So uh, that would be. Uh, at the government or the administrative perspective, but uh, from the uh, social justice or grassroots perspective, I think uh, we, we really can't wait for the government to, to move on that first. Uh, we as people can you know, take our own uh, initiatives to understand who a migrant is, who a refugee is. And um, I think I was actually very blessed growing up um, in, in university having to be part of the Catholic Student Society 
where uh, as a Johorian, I had so much uh, exposure and uh, solidarity with friends from Sabah and Sarawak. So uh, we, we had chance to mingle, we had chance to be part of very inclusive uh, community. So uh, I, I felt very sad that, you know, when, when, when we would listen to these questions of how, uh, how uh, underdeveloped, and I also got a chance to see some of the underdevelopment uh, uh, over there. It's, it's shocking. It's, it's, not, it's just not right that, you know, um, they, they, they are not treated in an equal sense of, of sharing the economic pie. Uh, that, that definitely is something should change in terms of policy. But uh, hopefully, uh, Marcela, I'm happy to know you're uh, a, a young uh, leader who's willing to, to take up the challenge. And I wish uh, all friends in Sabah Sarawak the best. Uh, you have my solidarity for that. All right, thank you. Uh, Thank you so much. Before we move on to, we have two more questions before we have um, two more questions before we have questions from the floor. Just a reminder, some of our participants actually haven't connected their audio, so they can't hear what we're saying. I'm not sure how they've been keeping up with this webinar if they <laughs> haven't been able to hear audio, but just a reminder for everyone um, that if you join audio and just mute your mic, you'll be able to see uh, the chat and hear us as well. Um, okay. So that, that, that's, all my, that's all the interjections for me. Going back to the questions, what are some critical steps that our government, this is going specifically to our government and not just um, the general public, that our government would need to take? Um, perhaps we could have Marcella or Adrian answer this since this is a question regarding um, quite political, uh, um, a very political issue. So any critical steps or policies that you know, the government needs to take? And if Ms. Azra, you want to chip in at any moment, feel, feel free. Yeah, Masala, you want to try attempt? Yes. Um, Critical, uh, like yes, any, any, any steps that the government would need to take, you know, um, providing more upskilling opportunities for East Malaysians, for example, or, um, you know, better education facilities, because you've talked a lot about the need for better education in, mm -hmm. in Sabah and Sarawak, or maybe even a refocusing on, on how the government brands um, Malaysians as a whole in terms of representation. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh... Just to mention that because Sarawak is coming to the national, like usually when we have competitions, uh, Sarawak is usually come to as a host that like one school from one district will be going to the national uh, national level. And however, that didn't like when it happened, can it's usually don't really well represented lah, like because Sarawak is like the whole populations of I mean the whole uh, place of Semenanjung Malaysia. So when we compete with other students uh, in the national level from other states, it usually like shall not be seen as a very small. It's only a small place that uh, representing Sarawak. So I think when it comes to competition, uh, sorry, I'll be very focusing on education since uh, that is the only thing that I was quite advocate. I was quite advocating with and very vocal with it. So I think uh. What the government can do is that try to uh, try to bring up more uh, representation uh, in Sarawak to the national level, like go going by district by district uh, instead of uh, one school as the representations for the whole state. Because yeah, Sarawak is quite big, and we have so many uh, school like. Uh, in Sarawak, like one district in Sarawak probably will just equal to one state in uh, Semenanjung, Malaysia. So uh, that's, that is what the, I hope government maybe can improve on that. And I also hope uh, more uh, students from the rural areas will also see that, uh, sorry, uh, I hope more uh, students will realize uh, how important education is and also be uh, get those access and opportunity of education in Sarawak like we have so many competitions and platforms that were provided however it's only cited to few people like the smart student especially when it comes to uh, STEM competition so you know we still have this stigma where uh, STEM and sign only for the smart people so 
the unempowered youth probably will just give up the opportunity and just see the smart people going up to the stage and yeah and just clapping uh over the downstairs the stage so i really feel the urge to have this uh priorities for the students for the especially the art student to even though the education system already push it to uh humanity and stick and stem stream but i still feel that the stigma is still existed and it doesn't change much it's only it only changed the name of the stream yeah so i do hope this really implement instead of just changing the name itself yeah all right thank you so much um our other panelists you can also answer this question or or we can move on to the next question um re re regarding um the critical steps that this government needs to take in terms of you know concrete policies um, yeah, so um, in terms of concrete policies, uh, like I shared, uh, there must be a con comprehensive policy for, for refugees and asylum seekers. And uh, even though we didn't sign the refugee convention, uh, at the regulatory level, uh, uh, there are already opportunities or spaces where uh, refugees and asylums can be given uh, documents and even the right to work. So that has happened and they, they have been experiments already done. So it's not impossible. Um, 180,000 is a very small number compared to uh, the, the, the Malaysian population. Uh, it can be managed, it can be managed. And we must realize that, um, that you know, they, they are just here temporary and they are willing to move out. Uh, in terms of migrants, uh, once again, I say that if as long as uh, the working environment is uh, forced labor uh, conditions, uh, Malaysians, you can't expect Malaysians to do that kind of work. So you need to fix the, the employment system and increase the wages. You definitely need to do that and, uh, and give those, let Malaysians have the chance to, to, to join those kind of jobs uh, using standards set by the International Labor Organization. So the, the, the documentation and the paperwork standards have already been set. It's just now the political will to do it. And unfortunately, in a very globalized, uh, capitalistic world, um, we don't get to set the agenda. It's big corporations, global supply chains. Uh, where do you think you get your Nikes from? Where do you think you get your, your, your fried oil from? You know, it's all, it's all your gloves, very controversial in relation. My, now, oh my God, it's giving us nightmares. So where do you think uh, all these cheap products come from? It, it all comes from, uh, from uh, certain exploitative environments. And while we wait for governments to take action, I think I challenge all of you as consumers to, to rethink your choices in, in, in how you live your life, how you, what, what uh, consumerism or consumeristic behaviors we ourselves practice. There are, there are implications, yeah? Thanks. All right, great. So this is our final question before we go on to the many, many questions that were, I'm glad to see the many, many questions from the floor that have been piling up in chat. This is our last question before we get to that. Going back to the theme of, you know, do Malaysians care? For those who do care, um, I hope people watching this do care. How can we, as citizens, um, what are the things that we can do to help? Um, I'll just go first. Um, I would say get involved, right? Um, hang on, my internet, can you guys hear me? It says my internet connection. Can no, nope, all, right? all good, we can yeah. hear you. So, um, yeah, get involved. Uh, there's so many things for us to do, you know. Um, I, I, I'll just relate a, a, a conversation I had with a friend not too long ago, um, pre-COVID, and we're talking about the um, best cities to live in in the world, right? And everyone was naming their cities and I chose uh, Kuala Lumpur. I have to go on record here and say that I'm not a Malaysian, but I've been living here 33 years and my husband and children are Malaysians, right? And I picked uh, Kuala Lumpur. And uh, the reasons they picked other cities was all the cities fantastic. It's this, it's that, and, you know, and the, the standard reasons. And I said, for me, it's, it has to be I, I Kuala Lumpur slash Malaysia because there is so much that I can do in a city like this, right? If I want to do nothing, I can. If I want to get involved in causes, take my pick, right? So go out there and get involved. 
okay? Because there is so much for us to do out there. And, and, and I don't know about you, Adrian, but me, I, I'm waiting to pass on the torch to the younger generation, right? Uh, <laughs> Right. I, I really would love for the young ones to step up. And I, I'm, I'm so happy to say that um, in Carefugees, uh, there are only a couple of us who are in our 50s. All right. The rest are in their 20s and 30s. And, it's, and as a result, um, we have zeal, we have enthusiasm, we have creativity, right? Because this is, this, is the, this is what the youngsters are about. You've got the energy, you've got the zeal, you've got the enthusiasm. So I would say, please, you guys, you know, I know you're in uni, your, your time is probably taken up by, you know, classes and lectures and everything else. And then you're going to go out in the workforce and work's going to consume you. But you know what? Time is what you make of it. Okay, time is what you make of it. Go out there and just find things to get your teeth into, sink them in. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Now we can move on to the audience questions, which have been piling up into the dozens. Okay, um, the first question that we'll pose to our speakers is from Kong. So regarding undocumented immigration, what do you think is the reality of the Malaysian government stance? So there's, of course, the official stance and there's, of course, what really happens on the ground. Kong asks, do you think the government acknowledges the issues but just turns a blind eye towards it because of these benefits of exploitation which you talked about before this? And yeah, so this could be based on your personal perspectives in, in working with um, undocumented, mi undocumented migrants and people who come in through undocumented immigration or your own research experience as, as well for our panelists. So. Oh, okay. Uh, let me attempt. So um, in terms of undocumented, it's a, very, it's a very unfortunate classification of a human being who has so much to celebrate and offer to the universe that we are boxed into a category called undocumented. <laughs> I feel that, uh, you know, it's something that we should challenge our worldview that one day when you guys become policymakers, please, 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 please rethink how this thing should be done. Yeah? So um, in Malaysia, refugees, asylum seekers, uh, workers who don't have uh, the, the proper permits are deemed as what we call party or the undocumented migrant or the harsh or non-human rights term is what we call illegal workers. Please don't ever use that term illegal workers or Ill no one is illegal. So it's just that it's a documentation and an administration issue. So um, unfortunately, in the way the Malaysian government handles it, um, the policy is of course to deport uh, all um, undocumented migrants. Uh, there's no real investigation into how they become undocumented. And this is the injustice that, that we need to solve. Uh, if we don't solve this, uh, this is where forced labor, human trafficking will continue. And when human trafficking and forced labor continues, you Malaysians, you will not get good jobs uh, because the victims and the survivors of forced labor or undocumented migrants are doing those jobs. And I'm telling you, um, uh, they, while they are made, forced to work 16 hours, 12 hours, uh, some things which you may definitely not be able to do, work on Sundays, work on public holidays for 1,100, you know, and, and there are migrants who do that for 10 years <laughs> uh, before moving out or before their, their quota finishes. So we, we, the government is addressing it, but uh, sadly not in an honest and sincere way. You, you, I have that on record, yeah. Thank you. Would any of the other panelists like to address this question or should we move on to the next one? Nope. Uh, all right, great. Um, our next question is regarding uh, East Malaysians. And we have two questions here, which I think I will merge into one to make it easier. Um, what do we think the level of appreciation for the East-West divide is from the perspective of West Malaysians? Yeah, so so I, 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 I assume what the question is trying to ask is, you know, do West Malaysians appreciate the gap? Do West Malaysians understand and appreciate the gap in development enough? And then secondly, um, East Malaysians are stereotyped as being trusting in the wrong leaders and fooled by empty promises. And this is why the state is undeveloped. Do we think that that claim is, um, is, is true? So, okay, firstly, do West Malaysians understand and truly appreciate the gap in development? And secondly, do we think that East Malaysians are easily fooled as the stereotype goes? 
Okay, so to answer about this, yes. uh, as for the level of appreciation, I don't know uh, much about, I don't know much about the West Malaysian perspective, but as for East Malaysian, we don't really care much about uh, from like what I mentioned in my sharing is that uh, we only want a education access and opportunity roads and internet coverage. And for the uh, regarded as trusting in the law, wrong leaders and easily fooled by empty promises. I, can I say that it was quite a, f not a very truthful and it is a false claim because... Uh, okay, yeah. Go, yeah because, absolutely, go ahead, yeah. Uh, from among all the politicians in uh, Sarawak that I've met, they actually be elected because of the thing that they has done. Because the people in Sarawak don't usually listen to what the new Chalon and candidate uh, ideologies and all that stuff because uh, usually the people say if you di like uh, when these politicians already uh, did something very beneficial to that uh, certain part of area they will be uh, they will keep on supporting this uh, candidate and as for like the wrong leaders I think the reason why it happened is because uh, GPS and all that party in Sarawak don't have much exposure in media so that's why uh, people are spreading around saying that uh, Sarawak people actually support the wrong leaders. Like, okay, sim the, the, the simplest uh, example can be my very own members of parliament, Datuk Tiong. Like, uh, I always listen from the West Malaysian, like, uh, especially in the parliament digital, they mentioned that uh, you have to go for, can for, uh, about a, uh, the general election uh, as a candidate for Bintulu in the next three years, but and, and then they really, really like they really dislike uh, Datuk Tiong and all that. But actually, Datuk Tiong is quite a good uh, politician in Bintulu because he has been contributing and doing a lot of work. But that doesn't appear in his social media and all that stuff. So, yeah, I think the the main reason why it becomes so popular that. Uh, support the wrong leader is just because they don't have much media exposure in uh, in social media. Yeah. Okay, cool. Do any of the other panelists want to chip in on this idea of West Malaysians not being appreciative enough or this gap between East and West Malaysia? Or if not, we can move on to uh, uh, the other questions. Oh, um, I, I mean, in my experience of uh, working with different uh, friends from all over Malaysia, I think uh, we shouldn't take for granted uh, friends across the South China Sea, uh, but to the to be inclusive, it cannot be the rhetorical uh, Merdeka Day slogan, you know, to 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 make everyone happy, put on your traditional dresses and dance. It cannot be. There's so much to be done. Uh, healthcare, education, uh, inclusivity. And uh, of course, the SDG has this uh, slogan, leave no one behind. And um, it, I think uh, it's actually Semenanjung Malaysia's loss if we don't include Sabahans and Sarawakians. There's just so much to learn uh, from them, be it scientifically. Um, uh, don't forget that um, the environment, there's so much to learn from what goes on there. Uh, there's so much natural resource. Uh, keep You must preserve that green lung, uh, which is so precious. Uh, don't lose it. Uh, we will have the impact. I think we saw the haze. Uh, the only time we, you know, wake up for a while is when the haze comes and then we look to Borneo. You know, that's that's just a small impact of what shouldn't be. So we, we should find more, um, more. I mean, we can take the steps. You know, we don't need to wait for the government to do that. Uh, elections is once in a while, but uh, we should organize more programs. And, and even in the human rights circle, uh, we are also guilty of uh, always... Uh, looking at the last moment, uh, oh, let's in invite uh, our friends from Sabah Sarawak to give an opinion. You know, it should always be an equal partnership from the start, uh, include them in certain processes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Any more, um, any more answers or we can go on to the next question? Okay. Uh, this next question, I think it doesn't say, but I think it would mainly be aimed towards uh, Miss Azra, actually, because of your experience with working with students, especially. The question is, in terms of caring or having empathy, going back to the team, do you think that 
there comes a point where caring too much about things like this results in people being taken advantage of with that other detrimental effects. And do you have any thoughts on, on that? So um, we care too much and then we get taken advantage of? Yeah. So right? I, I'm, um, I yeah, would assume yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I think one has to, um, you know, when, when you first go into um, work like this, social activism, um, you do tend to jump in, right? Um, and uh, kind of uh, go, in, go in and, yes, I, 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 I see what you mean by being taken advantage of. But over time, you kind of learn to um, navigate through it, right? Uh, caring doesn't stop, right? You just, you, you, I have to say this, right? People, people seem to think that um, volunteerism um, is something we do because it makes us feel good, right? We help others because it's fulfilling. It's not. It's not. You do it because it's something that needs to be done, right? You take up a course because someone's got to do it and why not you? It's not about you feeling good about it, right? Yeah, it's about him, that person out there needs help and you're in a position to do something about it, right? Sure, so forget all this caring and being taken advantage of. It's just going out there and getting things done. Bluntly, I, I'm saying it now, bluntly, okay? Yep. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for me, but yeah. I, I'm known to be, my, my son say I'm brutally honest. <laughs> so, yeah. No worries. Um, going back to a question if you, that I think you, learn, if you, yeah. you know, I mean, once you're in it, I understand. I understand the hesitation on certain people's, in uh, you know, in some people because you're so afraid of being taken advantage of, having empathy, etc. Right? But going anyway and learn to navigate, you will find your balance. You'll be able to know when someone's taking advantage of you, right? And you you'll be able to say no. Okay. I mean, that's important as well. well look, our resources are limited. Right, our resources are limit are limited, and very often we have to say no to people. Okay, but you become you become kind of um, no, you become battle hardy. Let's put it that way. You become battle hardy. You know? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Going back to a question that I think is aimed uh, more at uh, going back to Marcella. This question is about. Uh, this question is from Jofinta on a highly volatile topic, in her words. Um, she's a Sarawakian who observes that there is a lot of sentiment when it comes to secession or to separate from the Malaysian partnership. And whether this is on grounds of independence or not, it's not specified. But, you know, to avoid this, what do you think is a realistic method in order to balance um, catalyzing the rate of development in Sarawak, by this I assume, um, prioritizing development in Sarawak without um, recourse to threatening separation from West Malaysia. So in simplify the question, I, I would think the question is asking, you know, given that there is sentiment when it comes to separation from Malaysia, how do you think is the best way for us to approach this in terms of bringing up development without having to say, if you don't do this, we'll leave. Okay, this is quite a hard topic for me, but uh, going back to the question, I was getting uh, educated by this because I have a friend that is, uh, sorry, that is uh, very interested in MA63, Malaysian, uh, Malaysia Agreement 1963. So, uh, I don't know anything about MA63 back then, but after those sharing from him, uh, it was an eye-opening one. So I can say that I was quite interested in this equal partner and all that stuff. And th I think to approach this is to balance the education. Like when we are trying to deliver that uh, Sarawak and Peninsula Malaysia should be having an equal partner, uh, but at the same time, we also should uh, the students also should be educated the importance of accept care and respect for each other. So because MS sixty three and all that stuff usually is more to political issue. So the students uh, must be like it start from students uh, because I really believe that education is a very great tool for na nation building. So uh, to neutralize the 
education system lah. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone, anyone else can anyone else can at any time for any of these questions. Just a reminder: any of our panelists can can chip in if you if you feel like it. Um, but going on to cycling around again to another question that's uh, aimed at mostly directed towards Adrian. Um, Aisha asks about um, my, the, what you said about migrant productivity becoming, you know, uh, being three times, maybe even five times that of locals. Um, Aisha asks about the conservative rhetoric of migrants lining up for handouts and stealing our jobs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, her question is, how do we voice out and uh, cut against this notion that migrants are only worth how much money that they make for us, i.e., you know, seeing them as humans in their own right instead of just something to be used by corporations in order to assist us. Yeah, so I think to 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 relook at uh, the worldview of how we look at migrants, uh, one way is to relook at our own history, uh, our own personal history, where our our forefathers came from, ancestors came from, uh, the the forming of Malaysia itself, and and how. Uh, the, the colonizers help um, or or not really help, but uh, design uh, the country to be in such a way. Um, we we need to go back to that level to to relook uh, migration per se. Uh, unfortunately, um, here the the system the system is so exploitative. I even after so many years, I still don't see the political will to to change that perspe perspective. And it's sad because um, while uh, expats, expats have a better uh, working condition. They have a different set of regulations that that help them. Um, unfortunately, for the low skill or low income migrants, it's still a very, uh, a very uh, difficult situation. So uh, we 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 just need to relook, challenge our worldviews, uh, look at people as human beings first, and then uh, plan uh, the economy to be in a way that that is not exploitative. Uh, unfortunately, um, I think Malaysia uh, kind of like uh, has gotten addicted to this uh, economic advantage of having about thirty percent of the workforce migrants, and you know you keep uh, you keep extracting um, more and more from them. And uh, the COVID nineteen situation has even uh, put them in a more precarious condition. Uh, my goodness, if if anybody wants to know more, uh, we can have another forum on that. It's so shocking that uh, you know the, the the conditions that they're put in. Uh, but I just like to remind everyone that uh, I think your generation, uh, your generation is kind of blessed because uh, you you this this whole COVID nineteen is just smashed in your faces that you are forced to deal with it. Uh, and I think never in the history, I mean, in modern times, it'd be predicted. Uh, I don't think even quantum technology could have predicted and, and you can see the whole different systems collapsing. So your generation now has to deal with it. And, and as long as you have this mindset of we versus them, uh, I think Trump, versus, uh, Trump has created such a mess in his uh, trade wars and it's spilling over into how COVID is managed. Uh, we, we just cannot afford to have those those kind of of mental blocks uh, in order to survive and and for our own uh, human survival um, uh, instinct we need to to rethink uh, uh, how we look at at the other yeah Thank you so much. I was muted. Uh, thank you so much. Um, these are two questions from two people that I'm going to combine because I think they're uh, asking about roughly the same thing. And this is open to all our panelists. What are your opinions on the current generation when it comes to the youth or the workforce in how aware they are when it comes to social issues like racism and how can we improve? And the second part of the question is regarding specifically as well, Derek brings up um, a lot of hate circulating on, on social media. Uh, once again, refugees taking jobs away from people, so on and so forth. Derek's question is, do the majority of Malaysians, do you think they actually care about refugees specifically? As well as, you know, how do you think the youth in the workforce and the, the youth and those in the workforce, do you think they care enough about these issues? Do you think they could improve some more? Um, and do you think that there's enough initiative? 
So uh, I'll, I'll, simplify, I'll simplify it. When it comes to the current, today's <coughs> youth, you know, today's workforce, today's youth, is there enough awareness? Is there enough initiative? And we see a lot of hate nowadays. Do you think people actually care? Because of the very because of the, the rhetoric that we see nowadays, you know, Rohingyans should go back, so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, let let me attempt. Uh, I think just now Azra raised a very important point of how uh, how much positivity that uh, and and uh, generosity Malaysians showed towards uh, migrants, refugees, and uh, personally as a as a very harsh critic of Malaysians and the Malaysian government, I personally was shocked. Um, the experiment, uh, uh, which you can also go on to look at, as is the caremongering group, uh, Facebook group, for example. Absolute strangers were helping absolute strangers for no reason at all. I, I couldn't believe it, you know. So um, while there are also studies which have quantified statistically the discrimination towards migrants, um, but <clears throat> but we also saw that that overwhelming response, positive response on Malaysian. So it, it is good, but uh, the future of, of of humanity cannot just be cannot just rely on goodwill. Uh, it has to go the next step. We need to socialize this uh, in, at deeper levels. Uh, they need to be uh, structures, regulations put in place. So. Um, like it or not, COVID is going to force us to rethink all of this. And I wish everyone good luck in that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Do we have any other panelists who would like to answer this question? Um, I feel there is a general indifference, right? There is a general indifference um, that sort of gets pushed every once in a while when something just you know, grabs their attention. Um, so the a lot of the hate that we saw um, on social media was just, you know, rolling stone. It just kept rolling and rolling and people jumping on it, right? And and had it rolled the other way, I guess people would have just people would have still jumped on it and you know rolled along with it. So that it's it's indifference that um, um, not something we want to. Um, be in right because indifference you kind of just go with the flow whichever whichever way the wind's blowing you just go with it so I would say um, uh, a lot of the the hate that we saw on social media was just sort of um, people just galvanizing to it towards what was contemporary what was popular what was going on right and uh, and, and, and you can see as soon as something else comes up everyone galvanizes towards yeah. that you know yeah so indifference is what we need to overcome most of us yeah all right thank you uh, Marcella any opinions on this for the young people still being ignorant is it for the young people that be still being in orange, okay. Uh, can I say that uh, me myself back then is also a very ignorant student. Like, yeah, uh, yeah it, like uh, before attending this camp called uh, and violence camp that were uh, organized by UNICEF Malaysia, uh, Ministry of Education and Project ID. Uh, I was quite, I, I. I'm so keen and so confident that I will just move to Australia after <laughs> finishing my SPM, or pro because I feel like oh my gosh, Malaysia is so bad. I don't want to stay here, something like that. So, but after uh, getting the exposure of seeing uh, bullying, seeing uh, refugees and immigrants, it, I really think that uh, Malaysia still need young people. Uh, I mean, like Malaysia still need young people uh, to make a change because. As from what we see now, we have so many boomers that, yeah, that don't don't really care about young people. So, and all that social is issue and, uh, yeah. So, that uh that really prompt me to, uh, to be more open and really see that actually there is so many people that have, uh, need that, that I have, but they just need the things that I like I need I learn to be more uh, grateful to be appreciate all the things that I have like my uh, the access to education and all that yeah so I think 
uh, more students need to be explored about and they really need to see on the groundwork about what is ha ex exactly happening in Malaysia. Yeah. All right, great. Thanks so much. Okay, our next question is from uh, Unku Arifin, which is from more of a cultural perspective. Um, it's about the difference between the term immigrant and the term expatriate or expat. So Unku Arifin talks about how immigrant is more negative and it's used towards you know brown people or Asians or maybe low-skilled workers who come into a country, but expats seems to be used for white people who are more, held more highly when it comes to status in our society. Unku's question is, why do you think this is the reason and how do you think this has come to be in terms of how controversial it is? So any, any of our three panelists, um, feel, feel free to attempt this question on how we ended up with this situation where expats and migrants refer to different groups of people and we treat these groups of people different, so very differently. Uh, can I attempt? Yeah. So, um, I mean, the, it, it, for me, it's a matter of a class difference in how we, we, we box uh, people from different uh, economic status. Um, it's, it's huge. The difference is huge. Uh, uh, one example is expats uh, get to bring their families. They get to bring their children. Children can study. Um, your, I mean, you, you, can, you can get uh, married. You can get pregnant. Uh, unfortunately, for the low skill or the lower wage migrant, it's not the case. Uh, but um, you know, there's a saying that the more tighter the laws you put, people have a tendency to to look for solutions, and we have seen that happen. So there are migrants from low skill who you know have set up or brought their families. They are they are living uh, uh, decent lives, and and also their children are going to school. It, it can be done. There's absolutely no. Uh, logical reason in my mind that you know that prevents uh, a migrant or an expat for having the same standards. But the the argument is uh, because they are low wage, they may not be able to afford this. They may not be able to afford uh, you know medical treatment. But you know if if you normalize uh, justice, if you normalize labor standards, then you you wouldn't need to have a separate uh, set of 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 standards and. One thing that for me that really irritates me is that, you know, if you're an expat, you, you have a chance of, of becoming a permanent resident and then, uh, you know, down the road, being a Malaysian. Uh, this has unfortunately uh, been prohibited for the low-skilled migrant. And I, and I think that's really unfortunate, you know, because um, after 10 years, you, you develop the skills of, of an expert and you know you you graduate to different levels you become a supervisor you know you can go on to be a technician or I, i've seen low skill migrants do a really tough complex engineers job engineering jobs uh, i don't know don't ask me for what reason or what sector but it can be done so there's absolutely no reason for this class uh, discrimination um anyone else want to chip in their ideas on you know why this expat versus um, immigrant rhetoric has come about. It, it's just struck me that Miss Azra, you would actually be considered an <laughs> expat or a, or a migrant yourself as, as someone who's not Malaysian. Um, I, I just have a, a couple of um, observations. We, back in 1990, we lived in, a, in um, one of the Middle Eastern countries for a while. And when we first moved, um, we moved on an expat package. Uh, my husband's a Malaysian and um, he had to retake his uh, driving test because he, we come from the East, right? People coming from the West did not have to reset their driving test because they were the Europeans and the Americans, right? Whereas those of us coming from Asia had to, it didn't make sense to us, right? But there you already have this division, okay, based on skin color. And I have to add this, um, I hate to say this, right? Talking about racism, okay? And preferential treatment. I, I, I really don't know how to put this delicately. When I go to anywhere here in Malaysia, I get preferential treatment because of my skin color, right? Because of the way I look, because I've got green eyes, right? I, this, is, this is 
a, a, I don't know how to explain it. She's talking about expat, immigrant, um, migrant, uh, um, foreigner, local. Um, it, I don't know whether we can define how it began, um, where it began, right? It's just happened over years and years. Um, I mean, in, in so many cultures, when someone gets married, what's one of the first things you asked? Um, is he fair? When someone has a baby, um, is he fair? Right, we're always talking about skin color, right? So to ask where did it begin, it's a bit of a, a tough thing, uh, I think, to acknowledge that we're all in this and then try and uh, do something about it, it's much, much better. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, now a question aimed at Marcella, because she talked about um, education and its importance in shaping a better generation. Um, Alia Lee asks, uh, Marcella, do you think the current education syllabus is lacking in exposure towards things like racism and unity? Perhaps due in part to the fact that it's, that some people say the current syllabus is racially biased. Um, Alia Lee doesn't say in bias towards what race, but what, as a student yourself, um, what, is, what is your opinion on, what is your say on the current education syllabus and does it do enough in terms of racism, exposure, uh, national unity? Okay, so uh, I do agree with that, uh, like the education didn't expose enough about racism and all that stuff. And we mainly be talk about law and all that uh, article number section what in our moral book, specifically. And I still remember in my moral class around three weeks ago, uh, I don't know, around the midst of the Al Jazeera news happening. It's like, so my teachers touch on this and she mentioned that, uh, she, men she mentioned things very negatively. She said that uh, these immigrants are just immigrants. Why do they need so many things? I, um, I, I hate her until now, to be honest. Because she, because of the way she teaches us is like trying to make us really bad and trying to shape us into someone that really hate immigrants and refugees. So, uh, but however, there are some teachers that are really good in uh, explaining what is happening right now. And she said that uh, we cannot blame these uh, refugees and immigrants because this is not their choice to, uh, to be a refugee because uh, to be a refugee is never an option for them. So. Uh, I think even though the education system didn't expose well about it, but I think uh, teachers really play a big part and role in uh, educating the students regarding the social issue and all the current issues that is happening. So it really depends on few teacher young. They want to make students be more uh, to be not uh, to not be ignorant. So like. If we want to reform education uh, one hundred percently, I think it really need to take so many times and really need to take so many effort to just reform our education system like the Western one. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, this next question is uh, is directed at uh, anyone who wants to answer it, and I think it is a quite an interesting question. It was. Um, are more migrants always better for the local population? Because just now we talked a lot about the economic benefits that migrants bring and how, you know, of course, they're a net good onto, onto our society. But this question asks, is, it, is there a limit? Is it always economically and socially justifiable to just keep on bringing in more and more migrant workers? And the question points to Qatar, which is a country in the Middle East where 90% um, of the population are foreign nationals. So is, there, is it always more migrants are better? Um, do we think that there is a sort of upper limit? Do we think that Malaysia is anywhere near this upper limit, maybe? Uh, so uh, <clears throat> let me attempt to answer. So uh, in, in the Malaysian uh, plan, they have this five-year plans. So they, there's already a policy to reduce or cap uh, the percentage of foreign workers at, at 15%. So it's currently probably around 30, and the idea is to keep reducing. Uh, and now with COVID-19, as you know, uh, certain sectors collapse, uh, they, they, we will, uh, by regulation, it's always the migrant who will be retrenched first. So that, that will naturally happen. 
um, it, the theoretical question of whether um, migrants should should still be brought in. Actually, we need to look at who's offering the jobs. Um, if if the jobs are offered and their spaces, um, then you you invite, you offer migrants to a chance to come. So, I think the the way that that recruitment is done, it's normally we are inviting them to come. Uh, that is for the formal sector. For the undocumented migrants, uh, uh, our analysis is 90% uh, are those who you know ended up undocumented uh, because of forced labor, trafficking, smuggling. So it's not really their fault of ending up as uh, undocumented or in a party situation. So that, that question of... Um, of whether uh, it's uh, there's a limit, uh, of course. Naturally, in, in in when you plan your your industry, uh, the, there shouldn't be an over dependence of any factor, uh, because if that factor suddenly uh, reduces it, then you are in a fix. Uh, but but Malaysia has this big um, uh, ready human resource that can replace uh, any migrant or any Malaysian at any time. So even if migrants go back, you know, you still have the undocumented migrants to fill in the space. Uh, I can't imagine what Qatar will do if uh, one day, you know, the country of origin says, okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we, we need to develop our own country. Um, uh, goodbye. You know, I can't imagine what they will do. There, there are certain sectors which uh, their own nationalities are not being trained or orientated to do. So uh, there's a good experiment. I, I'd like all of you to go and study. Um, so Malaysia chased away foreigners from the Pasaborong Slayang and also the PJ uh, Old Town Market. Uh, it's already been two months uh, where Malaysians have replaced them. Uh, I would like some social scientists or even you all to go and have a look. And let's see how uh, Malaysians are coping, you know. Uh, yeah, maybe the salaries are 2,000. It's, it's better condition, but let's see. So it's very difficult. It's, it's, it, you really need to analyze by sector. Uh, but my point is uh, the migrants' uh, presence here shouldn't be a reason for Malaysians not to upskill and go to the next level. You know, That is our failure of the education system. It's a bad economic planning. Uh, there's an idea for TVET, uh, technical and vocational skills to upgrade. But you, know, you, you, you also don't forget that you have brain drain. They are Malaysians living. And Masala, let me uh, share with you that even if you want to go to Australia or, or wherever, it's okay. It's okay to migrate, to migrate. That's your right. You have the right to seek a better place for whatever reason. That is everyone's right. Uh, and there are a million plus Malaysians abroad seeking a better life. So that is there. But uh, to, to decide where you draw the line uh, by law, by regulation, it's already there. It should be capped at 15%. All right. Uh, that was a very comprehensive answer. Thank you very much. Um, any, would any of our other panelists like to attempt this question? Or we can move on to the next one, which is from Aisha Huzani again. So this is for all panelists, um, any and all. It's uh, quite a broad question. So how do we make the leap from, on one hand, we have individual actions. You know, we don't use the word party to dehumanize migrant, migrant workers. Personally, we treat migrant workers um, perhaps more kindly in our personal capacity. How do we go from individual actions like this to doing things together collectively? So fighting for structural reform, uh, things like unionizing, stopping deportations. I think, I think it's a really good question because how do we change things in how, how do you think we can change things from what I can do as an individual to taking part in larger groups in order to have a larger impact? So perhaps there are some organizations that our panelists work with that do work like this or perhaps any um, volunteer opportunities that you know of that would be relevant to everyone watching today. So this question is open to, to everyone in terms of how we can go from individual actions to group actions to fight for the things we care about, whether it's, you know, refugees, workers, uh, migrant workers, um, or even, you know, East Malaysians. Yeah, any, anyone? Um, if, you're keen, if you're keen to make changes in that sector, then join advocacy groups, right? Uh, we have many advocacy groups in the various areas um, um, 
so I, um, or take up the appropriate study at university. Um, I, um, for youngsters going out, it's always easy, easier to latch on to an existing organization rather than setting up your own. So what's your area of interest? Refugee, migrant workers, East Malaysia, whatever. Find the advocacy group, right, and join that. Um, get into positions of authority. Stand for office, right? Malaysians, you know, I mean, the good guys, you got to stand for office. Get into, in, into areas that where you can exact changes and not wait for others to exact changes. Um, I think... Um, as a foreigner living here, and I, and I love this place, right? Malaysians, do your bit for your country, right? You, you got to go in there and make the changes you want to see and get into positions of authority that will allow you to do that. And right after, you know, university, you've been a perfect, start scouting already, um, you know, which areas interest you and, 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 and start planning, charting your path. Yeah. Okay. I, I, tell my, I tell my children, right? Um, one lives overseas, the other three are here, that uh, part of your responsibility is really to serve your country, come back and serve your country, is what I tell them, yeah. Absolutely, yep. So, um, joining advocacy groups, getting into positions of authority in order to exact change, and, you know, studying things that are relevant to the cause. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else like to chip in on how to bring on opportunities and how we can bring forward things, these things into collective action? Uh, Marcella, you want to share? Yeah, but yeah, uh, Undi Sarawak is a great, is a great, great initiative, um, in in this field. Uh, yeah, I I agree with Miss Azra was saying grabbing the opportunity. So I still feel like you know, I realize that I realize that there are so many students, especially my classmate, they are actually very interested in. Uh, activism and advocacy for the things and the changes that they want to see but they just don't want to grab the opportunity to just go for it like uh, I'm quite blessed that uh, I already get exposed and having the bonds with few organizations like Project ID uh, a few people from UNICEF Malaysia and all that so uh, that is how I am really keen to, like, I, I don't feel really shy to just grab the opportunity that were given by them. So I also hope that my friends also can be Sam, like, just grabbing the opportunity and just try to uh, do more network building with people that have the same interests. Because, yeah, not like a changes can be met by individual but it always be a collective work by the whole team so uh, just have to go for the opportunity and just uh, believe in and continue to work for the changes that you want to see yeah right thank you very much yeah uh, any any opinions on this Adrian uh, so uh, just uh, two quick points I think uh, after elections, uh, we can always uh, go and talk to our adorns, uh, talk to our MPs, uh, bring, bring an idea, bring an idea or a critique to them, to their office, uh, try to engage. Uh, it can be uh, on a policy paper, it can be on a budget, um, it can be on a small project that you want to happen, or it can be uh, on a legislation that, that is being discussed. So. Uh, as a citizen, after uh, you vote, you can go to the next step. Uh, so it's a kind of like holding them accountable, um, asking for transparency on their report card, what they have done. So I think that is uh, one of the very big gaps in, in democracy uh, in Malaysia. Of course, it's good uh, you, you follow the crowd, uh, but you know there's nothing stopping you from going to your adults' office or even writing an email. Just, just try it. You, you may be shocked at, at the response. It could be uh, uh, something that you know they, they want to partner with you or uh, something that they have missed out in their policy work. So uh, take that first step. Uh, my second point is uh, there, there is a concept called uh, adult youth partnership. 
where you you find uh, or together with uh, someone who uh, has an experience, uh, you work together, but not in a superficial way. There are a lot of adults who who like to you know symbolically and you know superficially uh, say, okay, let's give the youth the space. But when it comes to the budget, uh, you get one percent, you know. Or when it comes to the the critical uh, engagement, yeah, they leave you out, or you're just an afterthought. So. <clears throat> but the adult youth partnership has a, a model where you may start out uh, at a different power relationship or equity level, but you slowly grow step by step until you're of equal in, in partnership. And uh, it goes to a level which, which I have personally experienced where uh, I learn from the young people. And that's why I really uh, appreciate that, uh, that uh, you know, people like Marcella are, are pushing the boundaries and, and even uh, MSGA, uh, when when I was reading your concept papers, I I, I was thinking you guys must be uh, absolutely bold or or nuts to discuss uh, a topic that is so critical. Uh, Fifteen years ago, I was told that uh, these topics can't be discussed publicly. Uh, racism was sensitive; don't talk about it. Uh, that was what my generation was told. Uh, but you guys have now broken out of the mold, so keep pushing the boundaries. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. We have time for maybe one last question before we have a very cute photo session with everyone. So um, if there aren't actually, we might also be short on time. So we can go right to the, the photo sh session right now. So the way photo sessions work in this COVID age is that everyone turns their mics on, tries to look as presentable as possible. And then I will beep a lovely member of MSGA who will take a screenshot, presumably of quite high quality and which we will be able to share later so everyone if you if you're comfortable just turn turning on your cameras it's okay no one's going to make fun of how you look and we'll have a, a nice group photo we'll give you guys a few seconds to figure out how to turn on your cameras <laughs> angle yourself so that you're presentable in that inside this photo yep okay um couple more seconds because people are still turning on their cameras yep okay should be good um yep so this is uh pose however you want you know uh this will be our photo session for this event three two one thank you msga okay great did we get that photo Yes. Jusian Paris, can we please confirm? Can we get a yes in chat for the photo? Otherwise, we'll yeah, have to I do it again. Photo. We got the photo, Jusian, great. Okay. Uh, two pages because there's uh, quite a number of participants. Yeah, all good. Okay, yeah, sure. Um, can all we right. take another photo? And this time of the. Uh, yeah, can we take another photo? Sure, sure, okay. Three, two, one. <laughs> This is my favorite part of every of every Zoom webinar, getting to have my photo taken and posted on social media for everyone to see. So <laughs> is that good? Yep, got it. All right, Thanks. great. Thank you everyone for coming and for giving us so many questions, which is absolutely great. Uh, thank you for our panelists as well for uh, contributing their time in order for this um, webinar to, to succeed. Everyone, be sure to check out, you know, the many initiatives and organizations that our panelists are from, you know, whether it's Undi Sarawak, Carefugees, or the North South Initiative. I'm from Undi Saksama. Check us out as well. Um, since everyone here has were really active in posing questions and so on. So thank you for joining everyone. That marks the end of this webinar. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, MSGA.